We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hey everyone, Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Show. This episode is a recording from KNVC 95.1 Carson Community Media in Carson City, Nevada. If you want to hear this live, tune in at noon Pacific time on Fridays and you can call in with your questions, you can send tweets, and you can interact with the show in real time. For now, you'll hear me ask to call in, but of course, don't call in because this is a recording. (laughs) Now onto the show. You're listening to The Archaeology Show with Chris Webster on KNVC 95.1 FM, Carson Community Media in Carson City, Nevada, and online at knvc.org forward slash listen dash live. TAS goes behind the headlines and articles to bring you the real stories about archaeology. Welcome to the show. Hello, listeners and fans of archaeology. I'm your host for the next hour, Chris Webster. I'm a contract archaeologist in a field we call cultural resources management. I also run the Archaeology Podcast Network. We have lots of shows about archaeology, and you can find them all at www.archpodnet.com. Today, in a few minutes here, I'm going to be talking with University of Nevada, Reno graduate student Richie Rosencrantz. Richie has a focus on Paleo-Indian projectile technology and chronology. We're going to talk about the age of Western Sten projectile points, what the heck that is and what all that means. So get ready with your questions. Speaking of questions, this is first and foremost a call-in show. Call in with your questions to 775-515-4141. That's 775-515-4141. You can also tweet your questions to ArcheoWebby, A-R-C-H-E-O-W-E-B-B-Y, or ARCPODNET, A-R-C-H-P-O-D-N-E-T. I will try to monitor those while we're in the situation here. So, again, call in with your questions about archaeology. It doesn't necessarily even need to be what we're talking about. I mean, I'm sure Richie and I would prefer that. But, uh, you know, call in uh, about anything you want. Um, I mean, this is a call-in show, like I said, and it's a call-in show about archaeology. And you've got two archaeologists here on the line right now. Um, call in with questions about history, archaeology on TV, questions about finding things on your property, I know anybody that that's listening to this that owns property in Nevada probably has stuff that they've found and maybe don't want to talk about. Who knows? Uh, but call in and we'll talk about it. Um, we'll do, do our best to steer you in the right direction. So anyway, that's 775-515-4141. All right. Let's get to the show. Richie, how's it going? Good, Chris. It's good to be here. Yeah, great. So you're a graduate student up at University of Nevada, Reno, so you're able to come down here to the studio, which is awesome. A lot of times my guests are calling in, but it's awesome to have somebody in the studio. So thanks for making the drive down. Why don't we start by just telling us a little bit about yourself, like how you got interested in archaeology. I mean, I was born in the 70s, so obviously Indiana Jones is why I got interested in archaeology, because I was like 10 when the first movie came out. (laughs) So how did you get interested in archaeology and what led you to UNR? Uh, I don't know. I think my story is similar to most archaeologists as a a young person or a child even. Uh, You know, always fascinated with the past and in history, and then as... We prog- as I progressed through school and took my first anth- first anthropology course, I was like, "Man, this is this is for me. Like, <laughs> I, this is what I'm doing." You know? Yeah, yeah. Did you do your undergrad at UNR as well? No, I'm actually um, originally from West Virginia. Okay. And I uh, did oh, my. I'm detecting the accents yeah. coming through now. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's, <laughs> some specific words I say, you'll be like, "Wow, he's from Appalachia." <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So I went to West Virginia University. Did, okay. I did my undergrad there. Nice, nice. Yeah. Okay, well. Let's talk about your research and and what's going on there. So first, I mentioned Western stemmed, and we're going to get to that in a second. But why don't you give us uh, – I'm going to put you on the spot here. Give us a quick overview of the prehistory of Nevada. Now, I don't mean let's go detailed into this thing, but where does this fit in? Because a lot of people may have heard the term Clovis, and that's probably the closest thing they have in their brains, uh, Clovis points, Clovis culture, things like that. But let's – Let's go back, you know, what is that date to? What is Western STEM date to? So we can frame this entire conversation in time. Yeah, well, that's a good question and kind of central to my project and yeah. all of, you know, Western STEM research in the West. And and historically, it's kind of been viewed in relation to Clovis because that's what everyone knows. And, you know, Clovis has been around, or the idea of Clovis and uh, megafauna hunting mm-hmm. uh, since the 30s. You sure. Know? And um, that's what typically people think of when we discuss the first people in North America is Mm -hmm. the plains in the Southwest 
Honey yeah. mammoths, honey bison, big game hunters falling around. And, you know, and that plays into the central idea of how when people first got here, coming through the ice-free corridor, following herds of animals, right? Right. But what does Western STEM have to do with that, <laughs> right? Like, we're, yeah. It's, it's not historically ever really even been considered. It's just like, oh, STEM points came out of Clovis points. It's later in time. Mm-hmm. And also partially comes from on the plains, there's a clear sequence of fluted Clovis points into stemmed projectile points. And, right. we, you know, as are like index fossils. But out here west of the Rocky Mountains, we don't have any buried Clovis sites, mm-hmm. none that are well dated. And really, we have no idea how old fluted points are in the West. And mm-hmm. there's a few sites, but it's, you know, they were either excavated long ago or the context is really tenuous. But what yeah. we do have at the basal components of all of our earliest sites are varieties of stem, stemmed projectile points that kind of has used as the moniker in this broader thing is the Western stem tradition. Okay. Yeah. So. Before we go much farther, I want to define some terms real quick. Yeah, let's do it. So Clovis, what, what is the approximate time frame for Clovis in this part of the world? Well, in the West, like I said, we don't really know, but you know, there's there's yeah. a there's a couple different um, time frames people use, but generally, the most precise one that was established about uh, ten years ago is about thirteen thousand two hundred to uh, twelve thousand eight hundred calendar years ago. Okay, so okay, that's absolute time, like thirteen thousand years ago from nineteen fifty. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, when we say – now, we're also talking about uh, – to to unpack this just a little bit, a lot of times when you hear people talk about stuff they've maybe found on their property, they always call them arrowheads. Yeah. Okay? Of course. And I've said this on the show before, but you never know if we're going to get new listeners or not, so I'll, I'll, I'll define it again. But not everything went on the head of an arrow. <laughs> Most things didn't. Yeah. Most things didn't, right? Yeah. Like like bow and arrow technology didn't even come till much later. Yeah, so about two thousand years ago, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So everything before that uh, was something else. And and a lot of times, and especially what we're talking about, are spear points or um, or even atlatl dart points, things yeah. like that. Absolutely. So so Clovis points um, are typically spear points, and and so are, if I'm not mistaken, the stemmed points as well. Are typically spear points, right? Yeah, well, there's also a lot of debate about that, too, of course. I'm sure there know. is. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I mean, just to make it all <laughs> condensable, um, stem points seem to be used for a variety of tasks, okay. um, which include use as spear projectiles and probably secondary functions as knives and mm-hmm. multipurpose cutting tools. Because, I mean, they're sharp rocks. They're going to work for a bunch of different things. Sure. In know? general, what do these uh, what do these stem points look like just for our, for our audience? Like how how long are they compared to like your hand or something to give these comparisons over the radio? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the biggest ones can be 10 centimeters long. Mm-hmm. So what's that like six or eight, seven inches? Something, something like, that. like that. Yeah. That's the biggest ones. Um, and we, we'll talk about mm-hmm. the age. Honestly, size kind of. Uh, in my research has found size kind of correlates to age, but we'll, we'll talk about that eventually. But okay. smaller ones are, you know, three to five centimeters, and they're usually pretty thick in cross-section. Um, okay. Parallel margins, sometimes big blades, and blades are like the sharp part, you know, mm-hmm. like the pointy part. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. And, yeah, and the flaking's kind of specific. It, it's flake patterns that go from the edges to the and meet in the middle. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're usually... Uh, they're usually really cool looking. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're really neat looking. Yeah, they're, I they're think so. Very well done too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of skill takes to to make something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. But you know, back then, I always like to think, well, was there a lot of skill, or is it just like a common knowledge? Like, is this just what you had to know to live? Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I kind of envision it as it's something you people learn from a very early age. Sure. You know, I mean, it's just part of your everyday life. Yeah. You know? I mean, and, and it is skill, but yeah. it's it's not like necessarily super specialized in my opinion i mean maybe it was in some cases but it could have been uh but like you said i mean it's probably just something people had to learn just to live like Absolutely. you drove down here in a car and so did i i mean that's an uber complicated piece of machinery and if we'd have told somebody that 100 <laughs> years ago or 150 years ago yeah. they would have been like my god you're like a genius but you know we give people driver's licenses at 16 years old <laughs> <laughs> good, good point yeah yeah no and i think that's a, a pretty decent metaphor yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and things like learning how to read and write i mean we do that really young so i think that was the equivalent of you know reading and writing back then so it's a it's a nice way to think about it okay so here in nevada how do we find this stuff is it is it laying on the ground are we digging in caves i mean where where are we finding these things in, in most cases well the majority of things are found around on the surface around mm-hmm. alluvial lake basins and yeah. that plays into that whole thing we were talking about earlier is we don't people have not really known the age of stem points because the vast majority of stuff in the Great Basin, Nevada and northern Oregon or southern central Oregon, mm-hmm. all that stuff's on the surface and there's no way to 
have any idea of how old it is. Sure. Um, but, you know, some of our best radiocarbon records and what my research has uh, really utilized is dry rock shelters. Okay. And, that, and that's kind of, it's funny, it's kind of a dichotomy to the, everything's on the surface except in these rock <laughs> shelters where everything is preserved. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so. we found a lot of cool stuff in rock shelters in Nevada that you just don't find anywhere else. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, basketry that's 10,000 sure. years old. Uh, like I, in my in my thesis, I've dated a piece of textile. Uh, it's some braided cordage that's mm-hmm. 12,500 years old. Wow. You know, like, wow. <laughs> yeah, and how are you dating stuff like that? Uh, well, it's so uh, radiocarbon dating. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like the golden standard for archaeologists. Sure. Um, any organic material can be dated with Absolutely, radiocarbon. Absolutely, you know, and it, it's the basic premise that when something dies, an mm-hmm. animal or plant, um, the the carbon in that uh, starts to uh, degrade. And right. Over a certain amount of time, it's, we call them half lives, half lives. Mm-hmm. You know, and then it's a really complex process at the atomic level. But uh, sure, you know, we can measure how much carbon. Basically, we can measure how much carbon's left and get an estimate of how old it is with a right. with a standard deviation. You know, now. Talking about dating, because this is what people always want to know about, is where does this stuff fit in the chronology, right? And, I mean, that's the the basic thing we're talking about here anyway. I mean, those are the ultimate questions. And how do you date – how are you dating these these rocks? Well, let's back up in a little second here. What kind of material are most of your Western stem points made out of? Well, that varies regionally. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in Nevada and Oregon, there's – exuberant obsidian sources and, yeah and that's the primary material that people use what it's it's easy to work it's high quality you can make super great, sharp super sharp and it's everywhere yeah. now in the eastern great basin or the bonneville basin mm-hmm. so over in utah and eastern nevada uh fgv so like fine grain volcanic so things that are like we call it uh, geologic terms like day site and anthracite, mm-hmm. but like basalt things yeah. like that they're, they're coarser grained and harder to work um those are the primary materials over there um, and then up in the plateau, so like Washington and uh, northern Idaho, it's uh, CCS or l- what people call flint or chert. Right, yeah. right. So it kind of varies regionally. but Right. And people kind of use what was around, you know. Yeah, I've never flint napped with, uh, with basalt-type materials before. But generally the, the rule with, with flint napping, which is the term for making these tools, of course, for our, for our listeners – the general rule is you're going to use something harder than the material you're you're flaking to to remove those flakes, but there's not a whole lot harder than basalt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hammer stones would have been really important. Right, yeah. right, right. So you're using differently shaped things and almost different techniques to to really remove those flakes, and and you don't get that really fine, really detailed like flaking patterns on basalt tools typically. No. Yeah. yeah, you just can't. I mean, no, it's, it's impossible. It, yeah, yeah, at least impossible with the tools that they had available to them. Yeah. So, Fresh mechanics. Yeah. Now, when the aliens landed, they had better tools. So, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to talk about aliens on this show ever. Um, all right. So, uh, so how now, now that we know what the materials are made out of? I mean, you can't you can't really date these rocks because the rocks themselves, the tools might be ten thousand years old, but the rocks might be, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of years old. So, how do you date these rocks? It's a, a brief archaeology lesson in relative dating. Here, yeah, so. there you go. Uh, so that was actually a big part of my my research is yeah. I was reassessing uh, the context of archaeological sites and the materials in them. Mm-hmm. And like you said, we can't directly date rocks. You know, the 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 most wonderful situation that's never happened with a with a stem point, but is if you have like uh, sinew or hafting material that's wrapped around mm. the projectile, which yeah. has been found in uh, you know like middle and late Holocene projectile points and you can take that piece of organic material and directly date it and you have bang like mm-hmm. that that was wrapped onto a, a shaft at this time yeah that's the ideal situation for dating a projectile point but yeah. most of the time we're restricted to archaeological sites or like you know living services so cultural features so like a, like a fire pit that's the most common and one of the, the best really mm-hmm. so if let's let's imagine we have a fire pit where your people are sitting around flint napping, doing their everyday activities, and they break their projectile point, mm-hmm. and leave it there, right? And then we come back ten thousand years later, a little excavation. Wow, this top of this hardest feature and this projectile point are at the same elevation. These have to be associated, or right. they. The most parsimonious explanation is that they're associated. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's another one of our good contexts, and so we can date that hearth, and we're like, okay, so. People were using this projectile point at this time at this at this place, mm-hmm. um, and then there's you know there's also there's a variety of you know maybe butchered animal bones, elk or bison or whatever you know like it's similar right. similar situation similar elevations the context is similar. So what I did is I went through all the stem sites and I reevaluated based on what was reported the 
the quality of the radiocarbon dates because not all radiocarbon dates are created equal mm-hmm. uh, and the context of those projectiles to those at those sites you know some right. and some are better than others but i uh kind of created an objective scoring system based on some other people's work and okay like this is reliable this isn't reliable and then i built a, a broader model with it sure so that that's a long-winded way to explain how we kind of date <laughs> rocks you know it's it's really yeah. about the context and archaeological interpretation which is complex Right. And the, and the term for this is relative dating because you're dating the object relative to other objects yeah. because it's really difficult to, to absolutely – we might be able to to date, I guess, chemically or microscopically the rocks themselves, but that doesn't do us a lot of good. No. And there are ways to – there are ways to date obsidian from the time it was flaked, obsidian hydration. In, indeed. But that's problematic. Yeah, there's – well, yeah. obsidian hydration is just really complex and yeah. it varies from obsidian source. It varies from burial. Right. You know, and there's – Environmental conditions throughout the time. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's a good technique to use in uh, conjunction with other things. Sure. You know, like just dating your site with obsidian hydration is kind of tenuous. But I'm involved with some research up in Oregon, too, with the University of Oregon, uh, the field school there. And Dennis Jenkins, who um, has been working very hard in the northern great basin to yeah. refine obsidian hydration up there and one and some of the sites in my thesis are kind of playing into that so we have stratified radiocarbon with stratified obsidian hydration and we can calculate the obsidian hydration rates to specific sources and kind of, they kind of support one another mm-hmm. in a way so yeah yeah and, and a brief uh just a really brief almost a layman's description because I've never studied obsidian hydration but I've of course looked it up and I know what it is uh but it's essentially Obsidian has this unique property that when you break it um, the, at the point of fracture or on the, like, say, the edges of a projectile point, assuming that the whole thing was, was, was created at the same time. I mean, it's entirely possible. I don't know how likely it is, but it's entirely possible that something was broken off when somebody was doing some testing. And then any number of years later, someone came back to this like quarry site and picked up this piece and then worked it even further, right? And so yeah. it's entirely possible that you've got different different times. Although more likely somebody picked it up and they, they, they created the piece and then they started, they started working it. But basically obsidian builds up this microscopic rind. And again, it's, it's like this, it's this thickness that you have to look at under a microscope. And I don't even think you can see it with like a 10 X hand lens. I mean, you have to look at it Mm -hmm. with a microscope and that rind builds up over time. And like you said, Richie, based on environmental conditions, how dry was it? How wet was it? And as we know, climate changes through the years. So Mm -hmm. you have to understand the climate to understand how to calibrate the obsidian hydration dating. And it's all just like crazy complicated. So yeah, I mean, um, the basic premise is the bigger the rind, the older it is. Right. But there's like, we've just talked about, there's a bunch of factors that influence it. And one of the biggest is temperature of of where it's buried. Mm Mm-hmm. But, yeah. yeah, so it's buried in a cave. You know, the temperature is going to be cooler throughout its lifetime. Yeah. You know, versus if it, you know, something like that. Which brings up another question that I've had people ask me a lot, and I want to get your thoughts on this: uh, reuse. So you mentioned, you know, finding a point attached with like sinew on it. Maybe even, you know, if it's in a cave, it might even still be attached to a shaft or something like that, or it could have something there, some organic material. But how do we know somebody didn't pick that up off the ground? We we walk around in the desert and find stuff all the time. How do we know someone else didn't do that? Pick it up and grab it. I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on on tackling that sort of problem? Well, reuse definitely happens throughout the archaeological record, and sure. it's really hard um, <laughs> to kind of to highlight. And some people focus on that specifically. And I've, yeah. I've read a few papers where they're really looking at retouch um, mm-hmm. or recycling. But I, I th- in my opinion, it's less often an issue than it is. If mm-hmm. That makes sense. Like. If the, usually you're going to see recycling when something weird's going on, like it maybe like so, it doesn't make sense. Like why is this form in with these other forms sure. of a projectile? And like it right. might be recycling, um, but it's you know it's the strongest way to go against recycling is like when you have assemblages of things together. Mm-hmm. But it's it's kind of a problem of equifinality that will sometimes you can't really yeah. address. Yeah, if you find one or two, you might not know. But if you find a whole bunch, and this one's the outlier, yeah. Exactly. Chances are it came in from somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I know one thing uh, that I've also paid attention to when I've been out working is um, it, you'll often find something that's got a nice wide base on it or something like that, but it's a super short projectile point uh, mm-hmm. because maybe it broke off when it was used last and somebody picked it up. Maybe it was the same person. Maybe it was 100 or 1,000 years later or 10,000 years – well, a couple thousand years later. 
and then they worked off that part and then made a, a shorter, fatter base, yeah, you know, projector absolutely. point. Yeah, so yeah, or like reuse it as a drill, or sure, or just sure. like a cutting tool. You know, that ha- that's probably the most common instances mm-hmm. of recycling. If I had to give them, yeah. give one, you know, yeah, because aerodynamically, it's got a you know, I don't know if they understood aerodynamics as we understand aerodynamics today, but they were pretty smart about putting stuff at different weights and things like that on the well, end of the shafts and spear points. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They may not know the terms for it, but they knew what they were doing. Yeah, they knew absolutely. it was going to work or not. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z E N C A S T R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on, and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% percent off your first three months or go to z-e-n-c-a-s-t-r dot com and use the code t-a-s looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field then check out an introduction to paleo radiography a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines created by archaeologist radiographer and lecturer james elliott the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education it is approved by the chartered institute for archaeologists as four hours of training that's in the uk for those of you that don't know so don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development for more information on pricing and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. Let's talk about your your, your Western stem stuff and get in a little bit a little more. So where so Clovis is poorly dated here in, in this the West. In the yeah. West. In yeah. the West. Um, and, and I have heard, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I've heard a, a lot of pre-Clovis talk. Um, with Western stem. Now, pre-Clovis is a very contentious issue in archaeology because a lot of people still think, and we're going to get into something wacky in a minute here, but a lot of people still think that Clovis is the first. Clovis first, you know, you hear the Clovis first theories. The the Clovis tradition came down and spread across the country, even into South America, and uh, and Clovis was all over the place. And that was the first thing to come down, like you said in the beginning, ice-free corridor, all that stuff. But how does Western stem challenge that a little bit? Well, before I start talking about specific things, let's envision these ideas as working hypotheses. Yeah. You know, things all that's how science works. We always right. new evidence changes things. Absolutely. Um, and just because you find one thing, one pre clovis site, let's say, doesn't necessarily undermine the whole this whole paradigm. <laughs> right. Not necessarily, you know. But But just it starts a, starts adding a, another piece to the puzzle. Exactly. Though. <laughs> and just as a disclaimer, you know. But uh yeah, no, so like I said earlier, Clovis first. Clovis are the first people who populated North America, and this and that marks the beginning of everything. Yeah. Right. And not just here in the West, and not just with Western stem, but there's a variety of sites that um, there are a number of sites where there's things that predate the age of Clovis, which I, we kind of went over in earlier in the podcast. Yeah. One of the, one of the earliest that's been around is Monte Verde down in southern south america it's yeah. a thousand years older than clovis it's like if clovis was first how did that happen so right? chile i think yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. southern chile along yeah. the coast actually yeah. um but in reference western stemmed uh paisley caves is hmm. uh in oregon a uh, place i'm very familiar with um about i guess what is it 2009 it's 2019 so about eight about eight years ago mm-hmm. um there uh, dennis jenkins and colleagues pu- published a paper where there's clear evidence of Western stem technology and Clovis age deposits, mm-hmm. which challenges the longstanding paradigm of Clovis being first. Right. It showed that it, at about 13,000 years ago, there were these two very different lithic technologies existing in North America at the same time. Mm-hmm. So that really questions like everything coming from Clovis. Yeah. And beneath those stem points were uh, numbers of copper lights, so he, old desiccated human poop. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, they're great little packages of data. <laughs> yeah. With human DNA in them that were directly dated to fourteen thousand years ago. Now, w- with those copper lights, there wasn't any diagnostic lith- lithics. So there was, you know, like flake tools and just really common stuff. But mm-hmm. there was it wasn't definitively Clovis or Western sure. stem one or the other. Now, how how far below this stuff was the human copper lights? If they weren't found with any tools, what are the chances that? And, and could you see this in the profiles of the digging? What are the chances that they didn't just you know poop on the floor they were living on and actually dug a hole through? these other layers and then now you've got them 
below this other stuff, but not temporarily below that other stuff. Well, I mean, that's certainly possible, I guess. But the radiocarbon dating program that Dennis and yeah. Tom Stafford have done at, at Paisley is they've ran about almost 300 radiocarbon dates. Nice. Um, and done multiple column samples of stratified series. And mm-hmm. every, things are well stratified. Um, so the idea that those copper lights are necessarily related to those projectile points mm-hmm. is less than likely in my opinion just okay. but they're they're not right underneath it's i you know i'd have to look at the sure. location but at least 25 or 30 centimeters and in between that 25 and 30 centimeters it's like 15 radiocarbon dates all on stratified yeah. sequence so well and back to relative dating uh, i mean in the copper lights we had what they were eating yeah you exactly. know so, so yeah. we don't just have human dna yeah. we have dna from other species uh, we have plant probably plant seeds and things like that that we can also date you know there's specialties to look at these specific things and say, well, this, you know, we have a lot of evidence that this plant species or this animal was around at this time, so it has to date to this time, you know, or, or this time frame at least. And you you use all those. I know it's like when uh, uh, to bring it back to something people might actually understand a little better is on a historic site, you know. We, we see historic trash dumps all the time out here in Nevada. People yeah. just go out in the desert. They still go out in the desert and dump their trash, right? <laughs> yeah. So we're going to be finding this stuff for hundreds of years. So. 100 years ago, somebody goes out and dumps their trash or you've got a mine that's working and they're dumping their trash to, to date the site because there's a lot of reuse of bottles and things like that, especially back then, reuse of cans even. Um, I mean, I don't know how many times I've found a log cabin syrup tin that's been repurposed into like a, a, you know, a candle holder or a light or something you know, with the side cut out of it. But with bottles and things like that, those were easier to reuse. So you take the, the date ranges of all these things, you line them up, and where they all cross somewhere in the middle – that's got to be where the the primary use period of this site was, right? Um, can't be before that. Can't really be after that. But somewhere right in the middle is probably where these things happen. So we date all these things. We look at all these pieces of evidence. Yeah. You bring in all these specialists. I mean, you're on a site and you're studying this stuff. It's not just archaeology anymore. I mean, oh, you've got not. a ton of specialists out there. Oh, yeah, geologists, yeah. <laughs> microbiologists. Sure. You know, and that's one of the things I love about archaeology. And it's, yeah, it's, it's teamwork. <laughs> yeah, you, well, you have to be, and especially with really old Yeah really important and rare sites like that it takes that's one thing i think dennis has really done a good job of at paisley when Mm -hmm. we're talking about this importance of this is like a huge team of people coming together to work on this yeah and the nice thing about uh, archaeology and really statistics too is that paisley caves uh eight years ago and i don't know if there's how much corroborating evidence has found since then at other sites Hmm. um, or if other as important sites have been found Yeah. yeah but the point is you have to assume when you find something like that that it's not an outlier because what are the chances we'd have found it? Found it. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> a lot happens in 14,000 years. A lot happens. A <laughs> yeah. lot happens. And if somebody is that well-developed and established in a cave in Oregon 14,000 years ago, you know they've been there for a long time. Yeah. I mean, they didn't just fly in on Paleo Airlines right then and, <laughs> and, and, and stop at this cave, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Wherever they came from, whether it was by sea or by land, yeah. had to have taken hundreds if not thousands of years in itself. Yeah, well – I think that's something that's coming out of my research too is yeah. you know where those earliest indications of people are in the west are really sparse there's only about two or three places and they're not like the brilliant hearth feature with the points that we would <laughs> like uh but reviewing all of the stem sites across the west at about 12,700 years ago so that's like mm-hmm. just after Clovis people are everywhere they're yeah. all they're all over Oregon they're all over eastern uh, the Eastern Great Basin in the Bonneville, yeah. and they're all over the plateau. So did they just appear in those 100 years? Or, mm-hmm. You know, I think it just makes us have to rethink the interior colonization a little, right. a little more than just people coming down the corridor and coming across, in sure. my opinion. Sure. You know, so a lot of people would tell me I'm crazy. but Yeah. And I, I think uh, I always get the question, or we start talking about this with somebody around here, you know, why is there so little evidence to all this? And I think my answer always is, and I don't see if this is right, is there were just fewer people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fewer people to leave fewer things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It makes it more difficult to find. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, most of the organic material is gone unless it's in a cave. Yeah. You know, and uh, so we're left with the rocks. And we have no way to date the rocks. And we have no way unless, to date the rocks. Unless they're with something organic. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So... Okay, uh, let's take a second here. Uh, call in with your questions if you've got them, 775-515-4141. Uh, 
Uh, I said that I would check Twitter and uh, and see if that's going on. I don't see any notifications, but uh, that's also really hard to check when you're doing a radio show. So <laughs> anyway, um, again, call in with your questions, 775-515-4141. You can always send me an email, especially if you're listening to the recording of this uh, on the Archaeology Podcast Network. Uh, we replay the recordings on archpodnet.com forward slash archaeology, and that's spelled A-R-C-H-A-E-O. Uh, L O G Y. There is a spelling of archaeology without that extra A in the middle, uh, but that's only crazy people and the British. So, um, actually, the U.S. government and the British. Everybody else spells it. A-E-O. I didn't realize the government did. Yeah, any any you look for government job postings and it's E O. Wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so seven seven five five one five four one four one. Anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world, really, you can use Skype or something like that to make a local phone call, and it costs you like two cents a minute, I think. Um, so anyway, uh, back to. Clovis and Western Stemmed, if somebody stops you on the street and says, Richie, how long ago did people come to this country? Did people come to this continent? What's your, what's your short answer without getting into a thesis description for them? <laughs> short answer. Um, from, from available knowledge right now, yeah. your research, you have to give them a time frame. There's a gun to your head or they're going to steal your wallet. When did people get here? <laughs> Man, you really put me on the spot. I'm, I'm going to get like mad at angry emails after nice, this. Nice, nice. But uh, at least about 14,000 years ago. Okay. Uh, you know, there's... And that's all over the Americas. Yeah. And it pushing it back any further than that is mere speculation, really. Right. I mean, there's a bunch of indicators that suggest that it is. Mm-hmm. Just not enough evidence yet. Yeah, well, you know, we're scientists. We like to be yeah. <laughs> very conservative. Well, and, and thinking about that, those, those outliers, at, at least what we're calling them right now, outliers... Uh, do you think let, – let's just assume – let's assume the dates for these things because we've got some sites in this continent. You mentioned Monte Verde in Chile. Um, there are some sites in the eastern northwest or eastern United States uh, that claim to date back quite a ways. And I think they've got fairly decent evidence for that. You know, They've got good dating. They've got other fairly decent evidence for, for some serious antiquity. What are your personal thoughts on that? Do you think that um, there were multiple migrations into this continent that maybe failed? And then, you know, at some point, enough people got over here and they figured it out and they were able to stay and make a living. And uh, and now we have the evidence for that. Or what are your personal thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think that kind of gets back to the question you asked me a minute ago. How does Western STEM fit into this whole yeah, colonization yeah. thing? And really the two – so all genetic data it strongly indicates that ancestors of – all the people that populated North America came from Southeast and Northeast Asia. And that's really complex, and I'd really boil that down really simply. <laughs> but uh, so that puts us in two possible migration routes, the, the classic, the ice-free corridor. Mm-hmm. So that's the ice, the ice sheets in Canada, sp- retreated a little bit, opened up this corridor kind of in central Canada where people came from, Beringia, as we call it, which is – West, Eastern Siberia and Western Alaska, right, and the Bering Strait, which is underwater now, and came down through the corridor. Right, that's the classic, and that's still. I, I'm pretty. I feel very certain that people did come down through that way. The question is, at what time did they come through that way? Yeah, and the other possible route is along the Pacific Coast, which has been studied far less. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, there's uh, several hypotheses out there. The Kelp Highway hypothesis is probably the kind of the clickbait name you might see. So people following these rich. Uh, resources of kelp beds, which support a, a great ecosystem of life, mm-hmm. um, and people kind of coast hopping down and then came into the northwest coast. Sure. And then populated from there. And there's been far more research in the Ice Free Corridor than in the coast, and there's some uh, there's some great people at the University of Victoria right now who are really trying to do some geologic modeling of where what land surfaces would have been, you know, deglaciated between mm-hmm. 14 and 16,000 years ago. Yeah. And, and they're really just getting started on that up there. I mean, there's a recent paper that uh, where they formed a predictive model. They're like, this should have been open at 14,000 years ago. They went there, they put in one test unit <laughs> and found 13,500 year old footprints. Yeah, you know, science. Like, what are the chances? You know, like, wow, <laughs> like one test unit, one meter by one meter and bang. They're like, oh, look. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and give me more grant funding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. I'm like, wish it was that easy out here, you know? Yeah. So those are really the two things we got to look at. And that's going to, we go back to it takes more than just archaeology, it takes mm-hmm. geologists and geomorphologists. And, right. And we got to figure out when those two routes were f- potentially open. And then we got to go look on where people might have left remains. Yeah. Right. So. And I think uh, I've heard of papers talking about. Uh, or at least articles talking about 
one of the benefits, if you can call it that, of climate change is there's stuff melting out of the permafrost up in Alaska. Yeah. You know, in, in, in that area. So we're actually maybe getting a little more information and things could be changing a lot here in the future. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Well, yeah. and like I said, those people up there working on the, the Canadians are doing great stuff. And, and I guess that kind of plays into Western STEM is if, you know, if we got to rethink this colonization of the interior, if, if people, if STEM points are earlier in the basin and the plateau, and there's really good evidence that they are, then on the plains, how, where did those people come from? Where's the most likely place people came from? And right. there's a number of us who are, you know, thinking that it's the coast mm -hmm. and it, where if you come down the pacific coast and you come south of the ice sheets and mm -hmm. the continental you what is now the continental u.s what the first place you're going to see are the, is the columbia river yeah and, and if you've ever been to the columbia river it's oh, yeah. it's massive and breathtaking yeah imagine and the salmon that run through there <laughs> oh my gosh you know and yeah. if people hit the columbia river and went east or you know eastward into the interior and spread out from there that well, there's a site in Idaho right along the Salmon River called mm -hmm. Cooper's Ferry. And, you know, Lauren Davis at uh, Oregon State has uh, just finished excavations there. So I'm hold your breath for the next couple of mm -hmm. years. And But it's really important stuff coming out of there. And Paisley Caves isn't that far from all of that. Right. You know. So. Yeah. It, it seems like – it seems like – you know, there were probably one-offs, I'm sure, but exploration for the sake of exploration is is a recent phenomenon in human times. And uh, yeah. and, and people back in the times that we're talking about, I mean, they were moving for survival, you know, yeah. following migration, following the food. So following them down the coast or, or through the corridor and then hitting these major rivers and these tributaries and things like that, they're, they're all really logical, good places to look. But as you said, it brings in more si more research too, because one of the one of the classes I took in my uh, graduate school, it was recommended to me, and it actually turned out to be really, really hard for me because it was it was a graduate course in fluvial geomorphology. Ah, I've taken a course like that. Too. Yeah, and I had no background before that. Oh, it's tough. Like, I know. I, I knew rivers moved around and stuff, <laughs> <laughs> but I never really understood it, right? Yeah. And, and why? And, and what's a straight terrace? What's a, what's a cut fill terrace? Yeah. Oh, my God. Bringing it all back, right? <laughs> and so – that was such an interesting course to me because what was even more interesting was not only understanding how rivers move. That was obviously important. Uh, and then you can, you, can look at, you can look at an area like a valley where there's a river and you can know what's really going to bound this river from a geological standpoint and what's not going to bound that river. So you know where to look for the, the older expressions of that river. Where, where are the yep. paleo you know, oxbows and things like that? And, and how to identify those in an excavation yep. you know, when yep. you look at yep. it and you, you're like – well, this is weird. The river's way over there. Why does this look like river's deposits? Why is well, there a gravel bar here? Why is yeah. there a gravel bar? Because there used to be a river here. Yeah. yeah. So understanding where those things are helps you understand how to find sites in the Absolutely. past, you know, because yeah. you, you can't look where the river's at now, yeah. you know, unless it, unless maybe it's the Grand Canyon and it's going through solid rock. Well, yeah. You know, the, but that's what you learn is rivers move less in that environment than they do, you know, in a, in a more, I guess, sandy environment or something you can cut through a little easier, right? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. All right. So w one thing I have to bring up because we're talking about really old stuff and uh, get your opinion on this if you've heard about it. I interviewed on the archaeology show, I think it was two years ago now, uh, and I can't remember his name, uh, unfortunately, but I interviewed the guy that did the reanalysis of the supposed 120,000-year-old site in San Diego. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sure you guys must have heard about it and talked about that. I'm very in your very familiar, yeah. All right. What are your, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm going to get like angry emails, man. <sighs> well, <laughs> I mean, one of the big things they say in that paper is this is, uh, uh, you know, these were hominids, so not necessarily Homo sapiens that did this, right? Which even that is a little tenuous for 120,000 years ago. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, where so I guess my big question is if something butchered a, a mastodon down there 120,000 years ago where is everything between 120 and 13 yes right there's nothing absolutely nothing that's solid i, I can tell you what his answer is when you're done i know yeah i know what his answer is yeah <laughs> uh and in my opinion there wasn't enough description of the geologic setting mm -hmm. right we it's hard to so they say that those large rocks are manuports sure but there's really no where's the geologic assessment of the surrounding area how did those get there mm -hmm. right um, uh, and I, I'm skeptical that those artifacts are artifacts. Right. Um, not that I've seen them in person or not. Sure. Right. Um, and, the, and then the dating technique is something that as a North American archeologist, 
not very familiar with, mm -hmm. right? That's not something we typically use. And yeah. I'm not, I, you know, I didn't come here prepared to critique the, the dating <laughs> methods, you know. No, for sure. There's tons of factors that, that go into that, the groundwater and yeah. whatever. Um, so, I mean, short answer is I'm not convinced by that, mm -hmm. right? And for mainly those reasons I just outlined. Sure. Now, if we keep finding them, sure, I'll change my mind. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I know, uh, just to put it out there, one of the things he told me was that uh, archaeologists don't dig deep enough. And that's, that's, that was his theory because he said – I guess. He said we stop, we stop when we hit a specific set of rules. And he's not wrong in, in, in a lot of cases, like especially if you're on like a cultural resource management project Certainly. and you've got a limited budget. Uh, you, you're, I've only been on a, a handful of projects and they were actually in the Northeast. And it was uh, well, the first time I ever saw this, I was digging in Vermont. And we had 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter test units that we were digging. And it was raining. You're in what was called Virgin's Clay, which was a horrific nightmare to put through a screen. Oh, in fact, I've, I've worked in the Northeast. Oh, yeah. So it was just a ridiculous thing. And I, me and my digging partner had one unit, and we were, we were the ones lucky enough to get tasked. We were digging right on the north uh, – sorry, the south, I think, eastern edge of uh, Lake Champlain. And, I mean, we could see the lake. It was right down the hill. And uh, – so we're digging right there, and he told us to just go down as far as our shovels would take us. It took us three days to dig this test unit because, I mean, the thing kept filling up with water. You pull out, like, one scoop oh, of shovel of with that suction method, you know? Oh, yeah. You throw that in your screen, and then we'd take our, our gloves and basically make, like, a loaf out of it and then slice it with the trowel because it doesn't go through the screen. No, no. Yeah. So we're doing that. We didn't find anything, but they wanted to look at what the soils were looking at, right? Mm -hmm. So that – it just reminded me of that because that was the one unit that went deep. Every other unit was going down maybe 20, 30 centimeters, yeah. right? And the reason they were stopping is because that's commonly thought where the archaeological material was stopping in that area based yeah. on other research, right? So out here in the West, we don't dig a lot of shovel tests in the Great Basin, but they yeah. do do a lot of shovel tests in California yeah. in different areas. And when they're digging these holes looking for stuff, I mean, to be honest, a lot of the times we stop is we either hit the water table – yeah. Or we hit bedrock, yeah. or we hit the length of our shovel. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's it. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons for that is I, a lot of times you're not going to disturb ground deeper than that with most construction projects anyway. Yeah. There you go. Right? So, yeah, so if you're not going to disturb it, that's our whole point of going there yeah. is to find the stuff that's going to be disturbed and, and assess the impacts of that construction method on that, right? So, so his argument is we're not digging deep enough. Yeah, but, you know, there's <laughs> – academic research out there at multiple institutions that are looking for things sure we you know like it's working out policies we yeah well, there's a lot of paleontology projects that specifically ex dig exactly. that exactly and uh, sure you yeah. know not every archaeological project is looking for sixty thousand year old archaeological materials but yeah people look we're <laughs> of course the grandfather of uh paleoanthropology lewis leakey Stuck a lot of claim in uh, in California. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another place that's been debunked a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, there's... yeah. But here's the thing: just from a pure philosophical standpoint, so you had the Calico site in California back that's, in the that's leaky. Yeah, yeah, that was leaky, and that was an older site from a discovery standpoint. But he showed up in what the 50s or something or 60s with some something Nat Geo like money, that. yeah, and uh, and started looking at it, and then was getting pretty excited about it. And uh, and then you've got this site in San Diego, and those are the two that I'm aware of that have that sort of antiquity or claimed antiquity. Now, let's go back 40, 50 years, and let's start talking about sites that are 10,000 years old. And people are questioning those That's because true. they didn't understand the dating methods that were being developed around that time. So who knows what we're going to be thinking in 50 years. We might have 100 sites that date back to 100,000 years. I'd love to think that. I mean, it's – you know, Or revised dating methods. It's true. You know? I mean, yeah. and like I said, if things like that come about, I'll change my mind. Yeah, but absolutely. I'm not convinced at this point. <laughs> you know, it's... I hear you. I hear you. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun T-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. Next week's show is a recorded show from the archaeology show that I actually just recorded yesterday. It's going to go out as a podcast in a few weeks. But one of the things that we talked about, my co-host and I, April, is transferable skills from archaeology. How do your skills in our, as an archaeologist translate to the real world? And one of the things I said, and you've alluded to this, was the archaeologist's power of description. Because, I mean, you've based your research on other people's notes 
and yeah. going back and reanalyzing those. Uh-huh. I did the same thing with my thesis. I looked at a site yeah. that was excavated in the 60s, a 9,000-year-old site that was excavated in the 60s and never fully analyzed. They yeah. just were they were clearing it out because they were making a reservoir. You know, all the PhDs in Georgia were handed out in the same time period when they dug this lake, right, <laughs> yeah. for this reservoir, and nobody ever finished any of it. Well, yeah. Yeah. So – I went back and, and reanalyzed over 50 boxes of artifacts yeah. and uh, you know pottery and projectile points and things like that and then wrote my thesis that was basically a site report that was never finished. And, 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 and if it weren't for the power of description, the, the notes, the drawings, the things like that, then archaeologists would have – you know we wouldn't have much to go back on. And, and it's nice to be able to go back to those things because you're dealing with sites that, are, that, are, that were excavated a long time ago in some cases, and they simply didn't have the knowledge that we have today. Yeah. They didn't have some of the dating methods we have yeah. today, and they didn't have some of the knowledge about the relative dating methods that we have today. Yeah. Maybe they didn't have the chronologies, the plant chronologies, the animal chronologies, things like that. So it's, it's really good to – you know, have that massive power description so somebody like yourself can come back and, and check this out. Yeah, that was like a really um, rewarding and exciting thing about yeah. my research as I went, you know, I redated mm-hmm. uh, six sites, um, obtained new dates from them. And one is Conley Caves up in Oregon where mm-hmm. I, we're actively excavating it and I'm involved in that. But the other five were from previously excavated sites that are housed at museums. And mm-hmm. Um, and I went to multiple museums. I went to the Nevada State Museum here in Carson City, who were wonderful and you know he- helped me so much. Yeah. Um, and the University of Oregon Museum, uh, the Museum of Natural History in, at Idaho. Um, nice. Yeah, and like I, so, I went through people's notes from the 1970s, and some were better than others. Yeah. And it was really rewarding to go back and you know, utilize those cultural materials. We talk about cultural resource management, and I think that curation and collections-based research is so important and so useful, Mm -hmm. and I think we need to do more of it. You know, I I think some people have this attitude when they get their PhD that we have to, we have to dig, (laughs) you know, and like, yeah, it's, you know, it's good to find new things, but there's a lot we can learn from. That's already, there's so much out there. It's already in the museums, you know. Especially from cultural resource management, because a lot of times the budget and time is just not there to do further analysis. Exactly, you know, and it's, yeah. And like you said, too, it's like we, they didn't have methods necessarily. Right. And it's great to be able to – and that's going to continue in the future, you know. Like I'm mm-hmm. sure people will redate the sites that we're excavating right now and be like yeah. – with new methods and learn new things. I try to highlight that when I have crews. Uh, and I ended up being a crew chief on this project I was on a few weeks ago and I talked about that on last week's show. Uh, I didn't know a whole lot about the regional chronologies of Southern California and Yuma, Arizona. Never worked down there before, right? Yeah. I'd worked in the El Centro area before, but we had just very different type of environment than we were working just 20 miles away. And I didn't know anything about the regional pottery typologies. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Projectile points, nothing, right? I didn't know what they were called, but I know how to describe them. Exactly. I there know enough go. about pottery that I can describe the temper. Yep. You know, I know what attributes to describe, the thickness, the glaze, the slip, the decoration, uh-huh. stuff like that. I don't know what you call it, but I can describe it, <laughs> uh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So... I think that's so important for people to be able to do, and that's what I highlight here. Like, I don't care if you know how to type a projectile point in the field. I don't care if you even know that it's an Elko quarter notch. I literally don't care in the field. Yeah. I want you to describe it because one of the things we don't do anymore, unless it's really special, but then you have to know that it's special and do your research, but we don't collect. Yeah. You know, we just don't, unless it's an excavation. Yeah. You know, we only collect if it's an excavation. If it's just a pedestrian survey where we're finding stuff on the surface, our job is to describe and take photos. Exactly. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a really good point. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're not going to – a grad student, if they come back in 20 years to look at this literature, all they're going to have is, uh, is a picture and our description. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you can't date that. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think that – I think we're losing a lot about that. But then we could have a whole, a whole show about the curation oh, yeah. crisis. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, because there's no room for any of this stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, there's too much well, material. There's not enough funding. People – People won't give the museums yeah. enough money to properly curate. Well, and one that's is the problem. One is tied to the other. If we had all the funding, we'd build more rooms to, to curate yeah. and blah, blah, blah. You and know. people to take care of it. Yeah, know. absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let me put the phone number out one more time. We've got about 12 minutes left. 775-515-4141. All right. So, Richie, what is the you, – you've done your research. We haven't really – to be honest, dove into your thesis. I mean, yeah. you've got a 300-page thesis, you know, so we're not really 200, gonna, 200. Sorry, 200-page thesis, so we're not going to really uh, dive into that. I know I opened up the Word document gave me for your draft thesis, and it's like 40,000-plus words. I was like, all right. I, I wrote a book, and it was 60,000 words. So Well, th- 30, you know. 30 pages of that is one big table. So don't, don't, don't give me too much credit. Yeah. 
Hey, that's a lot of there's a lot of uh, a lot of time that went into that table. Oh sure. man, yeah. Microsoft Word and tables. <sighs> that's oh, right. Wow. That's right. So let, just tell us what what is the tell me tell me two things. One, what is one major question your your basic hypothesis hypothesis for this thesis, and how did that work out? <laughs> yeah. So this I mean, that's research. Yeah, absolutely. So you know. We're talking about the Western Stim tradition, and we haven't really talked about it a ton, yeah. but it, within that, it's like nine different projectile point types. Mm-hmm. So, like, they're different forms that have were defined by different people in different places, <laughs> like, over the past 90 years. Mm-hmm. And we've never really been able to understand what that variation means. You yeah. know, there's, like, we talked about they serve different functions, possibly. Um, maybe they were part of this resharpening continuum where little ones are just like really resharpened big ones mm-hmm. and then someone's proposed uh like maybe these are different groups of people in the landscape right, right. and the fourth hypothesis and this is the one i test in my master's thesis is that these different forms date to different intervals within what we call the terminal pleistocene early holocene which is about fourteen thousand to about eight thousand five hundred years ago okay and kind of the current way when you find a stem point you're like oh it's terminal pleistocene early holocene which is 5,000 years, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. wow. That, like, it's a pretty big range. <laughs> yeah, it really doesn't help us at all. We're like, oh, it's paleo. It's... Yeah. So what I did was collected everything, all the existing sites, data new sites, and used some statistical modeling, and I, you know, kind of parsed out how different, and I, could, I really support my hypothesis. So I did find that different stem point forms date to different intervals. Mm-hmm. Um, so it has a lot of applications. Is what I really like about it is it lays a groundwork for dozens of more questions. You know, mm-hmm. we can re we can really read look at a bunch of things we've done in the past that we've just grouped into this five thousand year period. Sure. So we can like more precisely look at cultural what people were doing, human behavior, like changing human behavior through time, as well as like changing technology, and that's specifically what I looked at. Um, so, and it's also great in my opinion, for CRM archaeology. Because sure. we're talking about all of these surface scatters that we don't really know how old they are. Now mm-hmm. we can more, instead of grouping them into a 5,000-year period, we can throw it into a 1,000 years. Yeah. And that trickles up, if for lack of a better term, into like how we can better assess those questions I was just talking about. Okay. Well, good. Well, good. So where you're in the final stages of all this right now. Um, where, where are you going from here? Well, this summer... Um, Oh, this is actually a good thing. Um, <laughs> this summer I will be uh, working with the University of Oregon, uh, excavating a rock shelter in Central Oregon as part of the University of Oregon Archaeological Field School. So nice. undergraduate students um, sign up and we teach them how to excavate. They're part of our research team. So if anyone out there is looking for a field school, or you don't even have to be a student if you just want to come learn archaeology. And, you know, of course, you have to pay tuition to come. Sure. But please uh, contact me or just search University of Oregon Archaeological Field School. Yeah. And there's two. We have Conley Caves, one I'm involved in, and then there's also another one at Rimrock Draw Rock Shelter, which is in uh, is also in Central Oregon, mm-hmm. uh, ran by Patrick O'Grady, who's also at the U of O. Mm-hmm. So I'll be part of that research team doing that this summer. And then in the fall, my partner is doing her dissertation research at the U of O from, at Conley Caves. Um, and I will be in Eugene uh, working, hopefully, for the museum. That's my yeah. plan. Um, maybe other CRM firms if they're you know available. Okay. And I'm kind of waiting on my uh, my partner Caitlin McDonough to finish her uh, her dissertation and then I'll oh. and then I'll uh get my own. We'll have to get her down here in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> she does she does uh uh you know, she studies uh terminal Pisces early Holocene great nice. archaeology, but she does uh, uh archaeobotany. So she oh, looks wow. at plants. Yeah, and it's really understudied thing in the great Absolutely. Basin, so it, it her project at Conley Caves is going to be really exciting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as a rock guy, even I'm really excited, you know. I mean, that's got to be a really hard thing to study, too. Not to deviate too much, because yeah, I, I do no. want to interview her. Um, but <laughs> I would imagine most of her material from that age has to just come from caves. Yeah. Well, there's like two sites with plant data right now. Yeah. And then there's the Conley Caves that we've excavated. And last season, we found uh, multiple hearth features that are 12,000 years old. Mm-hmm. So she's um, got a really great sampling strategy set up. And she's going to look at those hearth features as well as non-hearth features to, yeah. to compare what might be cultural and what's not. And okay. to assess whether these people – because we just don't have – we're sure they use plants, but sure. we just don't really have the evidence that we can't – we don't know for sure. sure. Um, so, yeah, so that's okay. really exciting. Yeah. All right, so if funding and employment and paying the rent wasn't uh, an issue, <laughs> what are some of the big questions you'd like to work on for your career 
Oh, my As an archaeologist. Well, you know, I, I'm really invested in the Westminster tradition, yeah. and uh, I love it, and um, I want to continue to work in Oregon, but I'm also interested just uh, in diachronic cultural change and people's life ways in Oregon, mm-hmm. specifically. Um, it's a, kind of a unique place on the edge of the plateau and the the Columbia River, as well as the Great Basin. So there's sure. many questions, and that, that's really where I want to focus. But I also kind of want to do some research in West Virginia, go back home, because no one does, yeah. no one does any research there at all, especially in the Paleo period. Yeah. And I've done a little bit, kind of a survey of what's known. It's the first one in 50 years. It was like a little paper I did. Uh, but I would, it would be really fun to go back there and, uh, d- like, mm-hmm. do an excavation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What uh, – it's probably too late in the show to ask this question, but I'm going to do it anyway. What <laughs> – is there anything analogous or as confusing as Western stemmed in the eastern United States? Well, I mean – That you're aware of? You know, not that I'm super versed, mm-hmm. but uh, down in the southeast, there's um, ton- there's tons of uh, paleo projectile forms. Yeah. And they just – they have a paucity of dates. There's very few radiocarbon dates, and they like they kind of have a general sequence worked out. We're like, this is what we think it is, but they don't really know. Sure. And that, that's probably the best analogous thing, except we have rock shelters, and they don't. And <laughs> sorry, southeast, you know. Yeah. Well, they do have some caves, you know, like obviously in the Kentucky area and things like that. That's true. But I don't know how but much But early people in barely in the east, for some reason, didn't really go in rock shelters. Yeah. Especially, I mean, there's not a Clovis Point in a rock shelter anywhere. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, because you look at places like Africa and and some other places in Europe, and there are some some serious rock, especially like coastal rock shelters oh, where the entrances are underwater now. Yeah, yeah. Um, that were extensively used. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of information out of there. So, are you, are you, you, do you find anything in the Nevada area? Are they mostly just shelters, or are there any cave systems where you really do need to bring in some like lights and stuff? I don't know if we have that kind of environment here. I've never heard in of Nevada. Any. Yeah, or even Oregon for that matter. Um, my, well. You know, most of them are that people would have used are pretty shallow. I mean, sure. they're like cut by pluvial lakes, and you know, people aren't going to like hide deep in a cave. <laughs> and, you know, you can't see in there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. there are big caves, like a really big one. I think school in, in eastern Nevada is Smith Creek Cave, and it's like up on the mountain and like mm-hmm. thirty feet high and like twenty five feet deep. Right. I'd like to go there one day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the projectile points that we have um, in this world um world in this environment are named after these caves yeah well let's you, you know, know come up with a name with it i mean that's that's where they, they were dated and that's where they were they figured it all out so yeah. um that's pretty great so all right well richie thanks for thanks for coming on the show um we'll get your your partner caitlin caitlin uh, mcdonough yeah, yeah we're gonna we're gonna get her on hopefully she's listening i don't know <laughs> she's but, doing uh, her comprehensive exams right at the very moment, <laughs> at she'll, this she'll, moment. She'll, she'll listen later though nice 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 <laughs> All right. Well, as I mentioned earlier in the show, um, please feel free to call me. Uh, Not call me. Uh, You can call the station next time I come in. I'll be out next week, as I mentioned. But we have the Archaeology Show podcast recording that actually it's coming out here before it comes out as a podcast. And it's all about transferable skills. And I think this is really good because... This is applicable to other fields as well. You know, you're, you're looking at your job and you're saying, man, I've been doing this since I got out of high school. Uh, how can I possibly do anything else? Because none of these skills are transferable. But what we were taught, we were relating this all to archaeology and our power of description and visual acuity, being able to see stuff and training yourself to look at these things, working on a team, leadership skills, things like that, and how all that works. And then we relate all that, of course, back to um, back to archaeology. So it's going to be a pretty good show. I'll be at the Archaeology Channel International Film Festival and Corresponding Cultural Heritage Conference, whatever they call it, <laughs> in Eugene, Oregon next week, giving a presentation on podcasting and archaeology. So I will not be here. Again, listen to that. But as I said, you can email me, Chris, at Archaeology Podcast Network with any questions, literally anything. Um, if there's a past guest you heard of, I can, I can probably get the question to them and see if they can answer it, or I can try to answer it myself. And you can always tweet at Archaeowebby, A-R-C-H-E-O-W-E-B-B-Y, or at ArcPodNet, A-R-C-H-P-O-D-N-E-T. And feel free to check out archaeologypodcastnetwork.com for over 1,400 episodes related to archaeology. Our entire back catalog is on there. You can't find some of the back catalog on iTunes and some other resources because our hosting service only goes back 100 episodes, and some of our shows have hundreds and hundreds of episodes. So... If you want to see the back catalog, head on over to arcpodnet.com for that full catalog. All right? Well, that's it for this show. Uh, 
Thanks, Richie, for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right. And we will see all you guys next week on the recorded version of this show from the Archaeology Show. All right. Back again next time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Archaeology Show. Check out the show notes at www.archpodnet.com slash archaeology. On that page, you can schedule an interview, provide feedback, and search the archives. Be sure to check out the other great shows on the APN while you're there. If this is your first time listening, welcome. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your podcast catalog of choice. Listen to the live KNBC recordings most Fridays at noon Pacific time on www.knbc.org slash listen dash live. Thanks for listening and have an awesome day. This show is produced and recorded by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.